Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're going to look at uh, just a little brief review of the churches and then park on one of them. Um, seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter number 2 and chapter number 3. Literal, physical, literal churches uh, in Asia Minor, in what we'd call Turkey today. Um, they were real churches. That's, we, we are a local church. We believe in the church here at the Faith Baptist Church. We believe that the church is a body of born-again believers. And um, the Bible said that the church, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter number, what is it, chapter 16, verse 18, said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it upon himself. Christ would build his church. And then in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2, the Bible said, We're no more strangers, verse 19, and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth, unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, we're, we're again that body that's built it upon that solid foundation, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Jesus is our foundation. The apostles and the prophets laid the foundation. You and I do not get up at any given time and start laying a new foundation. We don't do that. We just build upon what's already been laid. And um, I am going to read in, in um, believe it or not, in Revelation here in a minute. Um, but I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you're writing these down, it's all about the church. It's all about the church. We looked at Matthew 16, 18. If you're taking notes, we've already looked at Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 19, 20, 21, and 22. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the foundation that we build on is already given by the apostles and the prophets. The Bible says in verse 9, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another man buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So there's not a new foundation. What we're doing here today is we're building on the foundation that's already been laid. Today we're going to hopefully provoke you to emulation, provoke you to an activity. You heard what you heard in Sunday school to provoke you. The Word of God will provoke you. If you listen, it will help you. It will provoke you. It will change you. Amen? And be what you need to be for Christ. Right, looking at the church, these are literal churches. The reason I read all that about the churches, people talk about the church, um, and they talk about the invisible body of Christ. Nowhere in the Bible did God ever address an invisible body. Nowhere. There were always local manifestations of that body. Now we can go to 1 Corinthians 12 and we'll find out that we're the body. It talks about the eyes and the ears and the fingers and the toes and the feet and so forth. But we all work together. We all work together in that body that makes up the body that you're looking at today. You know, Faith Baptist Church does not always function the way it should. Why? Because a lot of members of the body are absent. Doesn't function right. So we all need to be here to grow into a holy, a holy um, the Bible said in Ephesians 4, uh, we, we grow together in unity. That's what the whole purpose is, is meeting together and listening to the Word of God. So we're talking about literal, physical churches. In the Bible, God addresses the literal church of Ephesus in chapter 2 of Revelation. He addresses the physical church in Smyrna in chapter 2. And uh, also, uh, he addresses the physical church uh, there in um, uh, of Thyatira and Pergamos and on and on and on and, and um, Sardis 
And then uh, what else? After Sardis, you have uh, Philadelphia and then Laodicea. These are physical churches. When he writes the letters to the churches, he writes them to the people at Colossae, the church at Colossae. When he writes to the Thessalonians, the church at Thessalonica, uh, he writes to the church at Philippi. These are all literal, visible churches. Amen. And so how important is the local assembly? It's very, very, very important. Now, there's some things given in these churches in the book of uh, Revelation. Uh, there's, some, there's some strong points that were given about some of these churches, and then there was some negative points about these churches. Well, the Bible says here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, verse number 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And on and on. It begins to give some commendations about the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus is a picture of that spiritually powerful church. The spiritually powerful church of the first century. And who after the apostles died, the Bible said that they left their first love. Now, these are literal churches in Asia Minor, but each of the churches represent a, progressive, a progression of moving from the very first principles that God actually asked the church to adhere to. And sometimes we read these churches and we say, well, they represent different periods in church history. I think we can say that and be safe, but here's what I can say for sure. I can say for sure that these were literal churches that John picked up his pen and wrote these letters to that were existing in that particular time. But if we do look at the, at the situations of each churches, they do represent periods of church history. And the first one would represent that very powerful church. <clears throat> but then when the apostles died, they left their first love. In our Bible reading revival, I'm always reminded when I read the book of Judges, how that everyone from Moses and Joshua died when they came into the Judges. They simply forgot or left the first principles that Moses and Joshua was trying to teach them. And then what happened? Then they would get in trouble. They would cry to the Lord. The Lord would raise up a judge. And as long as that judge was godly and doing the right thing, it seemed like the land had rest, doesn't it? And it seemed like everything went well. But as soon as that particular judge died, what happened? They went back again. So here we're looking at a church that left its first love, in other words, and the Lord Jesus Christ. When, they, when the apostles died, they kind of got a little liberal, a little loose, and they went into some areas that they shouldn't have went in. And then we have the church in Smyrna. And uh, the Bible says here in uh, verse number 8, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and alive. Now, of course, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. We know who it is. But the church in Smyrna, we would say, covers a period of martyrdom from uh, during the second and third centuries, during which various pagan Roman rulers severely persecuted God's people. The church of Smyrna was very severely persecuted. <clears throat> then we go on to the church in Pergamos. And in verse number 12 through 17 of chapter 2, to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he which has a sharp two -ed, uh, sword with two edges. I know thy works, and so on. And you can read the description there of the church at Pergamos. Um, they were um, uh, full of corruption. The church at Pergamos was known for corruption of the Christian testimony through the uniting of the church and the state under Constantine. Did you know that the church is supposed to be separate? I don't know where we get separation of church and state. I don't, that's a man-made line that's not in the Constitution, by the way. Uh, no, at no time does it tell the church to stay out of government, but every time it tells the government to stay out of the church. Amen? So you can go to the polls and vote, and by the way, behind the pulpit, we can tell you not to vote for a Democrat. I can do that, and I know I'll be, I know I'll be uh, flogged after the service, but, <laughs> but you ought to vote conservative, amen? You ought to vote conservative, you ought to. Nowhere in my Bible am I to stay out of politics. The Bible said that God ordained politics, human government, 
under the Noahic covenant. And only I as a preacher could probably get away with making a statement I made a little prior there. I don't know. But anyway, stay in the book. You'll be concerned. You'll you will be conservative. You'll have a conservative view. OK, stay in the book. All right. So we have this uh, church at uh, Pergamos that reminds us not to get yoked up or let the government get yoked up in our church. Amen is what it says. And so we learn some things from these churches. And then in verse number 18 and following there in chapter 2, we have the church at Thyatira. And that deals with the period of the Dark Ages. We studied that in school. Do you remember those days we studied the Dark Ages in school? Well, in the Dark Ages, um, from the 6th century on through around the 15th century, and elements of that darkness still persist today, and they will continue to the end of time. Again, literal churches and some of the discrepancies they had, we notice those discrepancies are still lingering in the church today when it will finally culminate uh, in the false church of Laodicea during the tribulation. So it's, there's a lot of information here and a lot, too much really uh, to be given on a Sunday morning, but I'm going to get to one particular church here in just a minute. In um, verse number 1 through 6 of chapter 3, we have the church of uh, Sardis. Well, we missed the church, the church of Thyatira, the, the church of the Dark Ages. Uh, what, what happened is a lot of uh, Bible was corrupted. Bible doctrine was corrupted. They were telling people to not read the Bible, that the man behind the podium or the pulpit, he has all authority, so just listen to him. And then it seemed like there was a period that the church just got away from the Bible. Did you know there's churches that you walk in today that don't even encourage you to bring a Bible? They just want you to listen to them. They'll read something and they might read it in a language that you don't understand, like Latin or something like that. And then they'll do go through the motions and you'll feel good about your existence in that particular congregation at that particular day. And then you're good for another week. You're good till confession comes up again and you're good for all of that. Well, uh, that was what actually happened in the Dark Ages at the church there. And, uh, and Thyatira mentions it. And there's still that element that exists today. And then in Sardis, in chapter 3, it describes the rise and development and finally the corruption of the church during the Reformation. Although when the believing remnant broke away from the, from the Catholic Church, and um, actually some never did go along with the Lutheran movement as well, uh, but uh, that, that the people that broke away became very, very strong uh, in beliefs and doctrine, but it wasn't long after that till the liberal ideas crept in and they took root. All right, go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. The church at Philadelphia represents the true church, the last church before the rapture takes place. The rapture takes place. The door is open. God has opened the door. We have opportunity to go out into a lost and dying world and give the missionary message that Jesus Christ saves. Philadelphia is your missionary church and it will continue until the rapture. There's two things that's not preached on a lot today in the churches and that's rapture and hell. Both are real. Both are real. Hell is a real place. Brother Archer mentioned that outer darkness, the lake of fire, hell and death and the grave will be delivered up before the great white throne judgment according to Revelation chapter 20. And all whose names were not in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. The smoke of their torment, the Bible says, in a different place rises up forever and ever and ever and ever. There is no rest. There's no relaxation. There is no hope for, for that individual that's in the lake of fire. That's where they remain for eternity, for a million years. After a million years, they have another million years. 
After that when they have another one to look forward to, it's for eternity. Never, ever, ever escaping the torments of pain, the torments of mind, the corruption, the filth that is in the lake of fire. It's for eternity. That's what happens at the great white throne as people are cast in to the lake of fire that don't believe. There's not enough preaching on hell, but there's not enough preaching on the rapture either. The rapture. The rapture is an incentive for holy living. It is. If you'll look in the book of 1 Thessalonians, every chapter holds your place in Revelation. And go back to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Every chapter in 1 Thessalonians gives a reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what it does with that reference, it will relate the doctrine to a practical aspect of Christianity. It's what it does. And that's just something for you to study on. That's a different sermon. But in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, we have salvation and the deliverance from wrath. If you'll notice in verse 10 of 1 Thessalonians 1, And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from what? The wrath to come. We're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. And also, in every chapter, again, it teaches a practical Christian doctrine, and it has a... Uh, reference to the coming of Christ. Why? Because if we know that Jesus Christ's coming is imminent, we would want to be found doing exactly what Christ would want us to do. Be careful what you do. Amen? Be careful. Be careful. Keep under your body. Bring it into subjection. If you're not careful, my dear friend, you're going to pick up some scars you're going to carry with you for a lifetime. And so the Bible, anyway, while you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look at this in verse 13. The Bible, now remember now, the, the, the true church at Philadelphia, uh, it pictures that church that's going to last until the rapture. And then you have your false Laodicean apostate church uh, in its place during those seven years tribulation. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first. We're looking at the churches. The very first church represented there in Revelation chapter number 2 was the church of Ephesus. All, all since the apostles preaching, the apostles laid the foundation, every one that has heard the gospel message and placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be included in this rapture. Rapture is a catching away. Now, resurrection is not new. The Bible always talks about the resurrection. It talks about the resurrection all the way back in Genesis and all the way through the Old Testament. I talked about it even as we get in the Gospels and how Jesus raised Lazarus. So, and Job talked about, I know in the end day that in my flesh I shall stand in my flesh on the earth and I'll see Christ and I'll stand in this body though the skin worms destroy it. So the resurrection is not new. But here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have, a mystery being revealed and that is everyone that has placed their faith in Christ is going to come up out of that grave that has died but went before us is going to come up out of that grave and the Bible says in first uh, or in first Corinthians chapter 15 in verse number 51 and 52 that it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump the dead in Christ shall rise amen they're going to rise and this mortal is going to put on immortality this corruptible is going to put on incorruption according to 1 Corinthians 15. That's for everyone in Christ, the church age, the church age. Since the church started, everyone till now, what if it happens today? We which are alive and remain shall be caught up how? Together with them. And where are we going to meet the Lord? In the cloud in the clouds, and we're going to have a glorified body just like the Lord. And the rapture is not preached on enough. Either one of two things. 
it, Satan don't want it preached on because it does produce uh, a, a life of holiness expecting the imminent return of Christ or number two, people don't preach on it because they don't understand it. Paul revealed that mystery that was not understood. He reveals it in the book of Ephesians uh, as the church. He reveals it in 1 Thessalonians. He reveals it in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you'll notice in Revelation chapter number, um, chapter, chapter 4. Now, after the churches are mentioned, we have the apostate church in Laodicea at the end. And that's the professing church, as it were. Uh, but then in chapter 4, after this, after the church is caught away, after that seven years of trials and unprecedented tribulation, in chapter number 4, the Bible said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice uh, which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be thereafter, hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one that sat on the throne. And he that sat on a uh, set was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And listen, look at verse 4. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white remnant, and they had on their head crowns of gold. Crowns of gold. Now we have 24 elders sitting around the throne. This is a heavenly scene. The 24 elders, would everybody agree that they're in heaven? They're around the throne and uh, they have some type of clothing on and then they have a crown on. Well, if we go back in Scripture, we'll find 24 is a number for a ruling body. 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4 represent the church. And how do I know it's the church? Well, the white... Uh, the Bible says in um, white remnant, that's indicative of church age saints. When, when you're washed in the blood of Christ, your garments become white. White. Amen. White. Pure. Purity. White. And the Bible said not only that, but they had on their heads crowns of gold. Now that's not, there's two words for crown in the Bible. One's diadem and the other is Stephanos. Diadem is what Jesus Christ wears. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. No one's going to wear that particular crown. No one. But you and I, according to we've already read in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, you and I are building on the foundation that's already been laid, the church. Now we're building on that and we want our building to be pretty, don't we? We want our building to be right. We want it to be appealing. We want it, number one, to be right, but we want it to be appealing that we could actually attract others to know the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now when we're judged for our works in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bible said that your works was going to do one of two things. It was either going to withstand the fire and you receive a reward, or it was going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. Now, the Lord's coming back at any time can he find you with some works that are going to withstand the fire? I say that to say this. When you receive your rewards, you receive the crowns. That's Stephanus. All right. In, first, in uh, Revelation chapter 4, we have 24 elders clothed in white, indicative of church age saints, and they have their crowns on. What does that mean? They've already stood before the judgment seat of Christ. They've already stood before the judgment seat of Christ. All right, and then we're in heaven. All right, we're in heaven. But anyway, I was just giving you that background about the church. We're in the age where the rapture could happen, could happen at any moment. There is nothing, not one thing, to withhold the coming of Christ in the clouds. Not one thing. If you'll notice in that Philadelphian age, that's exactly where we are. We're at the church. The church of the open door. Amen. Now, if you'll notice, let's talk about this church of the open door. Now, we're, we're going to go away one day. I hope you're saved. If you're not saved, you're going to be left behind. And God help you is all I can say. God help you. Just get in the Bible. Stay in the Bible. I've, I've no parents that have written their children letters and said, do not open till after I'm gone. 
And uh, they, they believe in a rapture so much. These parents believed in a rapture so much that if they're gone and their children can't find them, then they're going to open that. And it, it gives instructions of how to uh, where to find Christ and what to look at and see what's happened. You know, don't be in that crowd that will have to wait and look and search. If you're not careful, if you if you miss the rapture and you go through that period, it could be it could be as deceived as you are now. That deception, I promise you, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, is going to be worse. You'll more likely not believe than you will believe. So you better get a hold of it now so that you can go to heaven. You better get a hold of it now. Amen? And uh, anyway, we go back to Revelation, please, if you will. Revelation chapter 2, we're at the church, I mean chapter 3, we're at the church of, uh, of uh, Philadelphia. And we're looking in verse number 7 at the speaker. The Bible looks at the description, gives us a description of this speaker. The Bible said, He that is holy. Now, the character of Christ presented, that's really, that's, that's all we need. We don't need any more adjectives, do we? He's holy. He's holy. Uh, for perfect holiness can never be added to. Perfect holiness Cannot be, cannot be added to. In other words, he is the standard of perfection. He is not only perfectly holy, but he's unchangeably holy. The Bible says in Malachi chapter number three, verse number six, I am the Lord and I change not. Did you know that God has always been what he is and will always be what he has been? Sounds like a riddle almost, doesn't it? But God never changes. God never changes. He's holy. Abraham's God is our God. Jacob's God is our God. The God of the Old Testament is our God. Today, in January of 2018, as he was then, so is he now. He is holy. And the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be considered less holy than God the Father because Christ Jesus is is God. Christ Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, according to the book of Colossians. God will be to us what he is. The same promise he gave Moses in Exodus 3, I am that I am is our promise. Amen. Now, God is right. God is good. God acts as a result of who he is, and he is truth. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We know that in ourselves we cannot live holy lives. So what God has done, he's made provision for us by placing his holiness in us. Did y'all catch what Brother Archer said? There's nothing good I can do. There's nothing good that could ever come out of me. So it has to be someone in me that brings out the good. It has to be the Holy Spirit in you. That's what the Bible means when it says we're created uh, that, that's what we're, Ephesians 2.10, thank you. Zip. <laughs> Amen. Ephesians 2.10, that's what we do. We work because we are saved. We don't work to get saved. We work because we are saved. And that should bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ living in us will also live his holy life through us. Amen. Now, the Bible says not only he that, uh, uh, in verse number 7, uh, he that is true, but the Bible said, he that hath the key of David, there in verse 7. Did you know that's simply authority? The Lord Jesus Christ has all authority. The Bible makes it very clear, even back in the Old Testament. Let's turn back to Isaiah chapter number 22, if you will. Isaiah 22, the Bible says in verse number 22, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And none shall open. So what we're looking at in Revelation, we're looking at already what's been said in Isaiah. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The key is authority. Did you know that Isaiah chapter number 9 mentions that as well? The government's going to be on his shoulder. He is in charge. He has all authority. 
To turn over a key to someone is symbolically turning over control or authority to that person. Why? Because the key is a symbol of authority. In Philippians chapter number 2, verse 9, 10, and 11, Christ Jesus has been given a name above every name. Above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Things in earth, things in heaven, things under the earth. And everyone's going to know that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus is uh, God. He has all authority. He, ha he is supreme. He possesses all power to go along with with that authority. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. If all power is given to the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven and in earth, what's the next word there in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18? Go. If all power is given unto Christ, then we're to go. We're to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end of the, end of the world, into the earth. And when God opens a door, no man can shut it. And when God shuts a door, no man can open it. This is not a declaration of his ability to perform, but it's rather a statement of what he said he would do. You see the difference? The door's open. Yet, I wonder here at the Faith Baptist Church, with all that we know, with all of the discrepancies that's come in the local church, and we're still reading about the churches in Revelation, I wonder if the Faith Baptist Church knows that it's still our responsibility to go. When the door is open, what should we do? We should go. He opens a door that no man can open. There's doors open that have never been opened. Burma is being opened. Central Asia is being opened. Did you know next door is still open? There might be coming a day in your life in the United States of America, the door might be shut. You don't know that for sure, neither do I. But I know what he opened, no man can shut. And what he shut, no man can open. We have a responsibility. God opened the door so we can go with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God. And the Bible says that we go on from faith to faith and the just shall live by faith there in verse 17. So you have the gospel. It's one thing to say we have the gospel, but what is the gospel? The gospel is good news, especially the good news concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, God became a man and went to Calvary. And there on Calvary, God, God placed all of your sins and all of your transgressions and all of your inconsistencies and all of the writings that were against you, everything that was against you, everything uh, about unholiness He placed on Christ and judged Christ for you so you could receive Him and be a part of the family that we sing about here every Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Amen. You can receive Christ. And put on the boots, put on the helmet and start marching as a soldier and the doors open and go tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The door is wide open even to those that are trying to hide from God. The door is open. Everyone has an opportunity and has the right to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ at least once. Amen. So you go and tell. The Bible says in verse number 8 of Revelation chapter 3, thou has little strength. Jesus is speaking to a minority. Did you know the church at Philadelphia is a minority? The true church is a minority. The Bible said the field is white unto harvest in John chapter 4 verse number 35. In Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 37, the Bible said, but the laborers are few. I wish it was different. I wish it said the laborers were a lot. So he tells us to pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest would send laborers into his harvest. The door is wide open. The organized church counts its millions. Their constant emphasis 
they believe with such numbers behind them, they can open their own doors. Isn't that what's happening today? It's opening its own doors. Opening its own doors. But what Jesus did, he took the minority, he took 12, and he turned the whole world upside down. When you get to the point of saying like the Apostle Paul did in Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. God's ready to use you. He's ready to use you. You'll be a Philadelphian church. The church, the gates of hell will never ever prevail against you. You can't cuss it down. You can't tear it down. It's built upon Christ. Built upon Christ. My question to you, are you part of the family of God? Let's stand to our feet, please, if you will. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your message today. Thank you for this precious church, dear God, your church. I pray, dear God, you would help us, Lord, just uh, renew that vision in our hearts and minds. Lord, the door is open. We have the opportunity to carry the gospel to a lost and dying world. I pray, Father, that uh, people would lay aside the weight that so easily besets us and commit today. Commit today to magnify the Lord, to share Christ wherever they go. And we'll thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.